love and relationship with you. And even though at the very beginning we walked away from that, you still made a way through Jesus to restore that relationship with us. And we thank you that you love us that much to do it. Bless this time, we ask, the baptisms, the, the time that Scott speaks, and our time shared together as we communi- uh, spend time in community this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Howard. And yes, you did detect an accent. A couple of people are like, where's Howard from? I said, from the land of hobbits and wizards. <laughs> Love, Howard. Janetta. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, Luke chapter 17 is where we're going to uh, turn this morning. This is such a relevant topic, w- what we're talking about. Um, and uh, I guess it's not my personal goal to, to have us rethink uh, what church is, but, but it is. And I think um, a lot of people have, have bought into something that's so less than what God has designed us to be. The, the church is not an institution. The church isn't a building. The church isn't stained glass. The church isn't big organ. Uh, Someone said this week, the church is more than laser beams, tight jeans, and fog machines. Yeah! (laughs) Listen, I'm going as tight as I can go, you guys, all right? So the church is more than that. The church is an organic, living thing made up of people. And unfortunately, people are erratic. People are unpredictable. People make mistakes. People are fallible. Can I get an amen from somebody? I have, I have been hurt by the church, and yet somehow God brings me back to this community. I'm not saying you as a church have hurt me, little c, big c. All of us, I think, probably have had some negative things happen to us by the church. And I get that, and I understand that, and, and I think that's why there was a mantra years ago that Lori and I used to share in, in trying to hopefully recapture people to, 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 to not give up on the church. You know, perhaps you've given up on the church, but you haven't given up on God, then we're for you. You know, but I'm not saying we're not going to make mistakes. I'm not saying we're not going to hurt you. I mean, we probably will, but, but how do we navigate this thing called life without one another? Right? This is why we have, to, we have to strip down all the veneer, the show, the ponies, the flying Jesuses, all that stuff, and go, what is this about in an organic way? What is the church? Too many of us look for all the wrong things when it comes to a church. How's the kids program? That's not important. How many tattoos does the pastor have? That's not important. None, for the record. <laughs> Yet. You know? What is important? Here's what's important. A desperation to be conformed into the image of Jesus. I'm going to say, that's the top. If you're not asking that question when you're hopping and shopping for, for churches, you're asking the wrong questions. A church that's willing to say, we're going to kick you out if that's not your pursuit. I want a church like that. Because what they're saying is that there are things more important than your own personal choices. What kind of coffee does that church serve? Not important. Sozo, by the way. (laughs) It's not important. Like we all, we ask the wrong questions. How's the music program? Amazing. But that's not important, is it? Is the pastor's wife involved in ministry? You know? Do they make us break up in the small groups and make it awkward? Because this is really, really awkward. What is important? People who are desperate for Jesus and want nothing else but his will. That, that's important. And if that's not important, then guess what? I honestly don't want to be a part of it. Because we're... we're we're in this together, this thing called church. And I keep tripping over this. Who rearranged? No, just kidding. <laughs> there's, there's actually, it, 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 Howard mentioned it, and I want to I really kind of bridge off it. Your faith is not a privatized journey. Your faith before God is not, you're not the lone ranger in this thing. 
called faith. We're in this together. Does that mean we're going to agree on every single thing? No. Because God calls us not to uniformity, but to unity. Right? Church means there's a lot of different types of people come from all different types of backgrounds who have all different types of opinions about things, and it's okay to be together, and we can agree to disagree and still be men and women when it's all said and done. Not some sort of petulant children in the kindergarten class where the teacher can't get a hold of them. We're so much more than that, you guys. It is not a privatized experience of faith. We have responsibilities to one another. You may have voted for Biden. You may have voted for Trump. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is do you love Jesus? I'll let him sort out all the other stuff. Do you love, you know, mask, no mask. Tell you what, tell you what my wife posts that he, the day Ducey dropped the mask mandate. All crap hits the fan. You know what I did? Literally, within minutes, I come over here. I walk in without a mask on to the shop. People were like, that guy's going rogue. Who is that? I take the signs off the window. And you would have thought I was slaughtering babies in, on Alma School. Right? The posts that my wife's crying over, right? Because some people are, they're asses. Let's just be honest. They're asses. Yes, you can say that in church, you guys. You realize this, right? It's one thing to have an opinion. It's one thing to be an ass about it. And you know what I think about that? I think about the fact that if you're going to be an ass about that, that's not my chief concern. My chief concern is, where's God in your life? That you have to be so torqued about this particular topic, I'm going, I worry about your heart. I worry about your soul. How do we relate with one another when things, you know what, I don't, you I totally respect your opinion about us not wearing masks. That's okay. You can have your opinion, but you know, I'm not going to break fellowship over it. Don't we break fellowship over stupid things? We have had a year where we have been fighting the wrong battles. This is not about presidents. This is not about vaccines. This is not about the economy. This is not about the coronavirus. This is how do we become better people as far as humanity. And you know what? If God's going to give us a grade of how we've acted this past year, he's given us an F. He's given us an F. Because he's saying you guys are focused on all the wrong things. I'm not saying there haven't been moments where you, you know, our faith in humanity has been restored. There's been moments. But I'll tell you what, if an alien race came down here and looked at us, they'd sit there going, I don't know if we want to land on this planet. We have responsibilities to each other. Here's where I'm calling the church to something greater today. If you want to be a part of something radical, I invite you to be a part of this. If what I say today drives you away, I'm going to say, I'm going to pray for your future journey. And go look for whatever you want, tickle your ears, tickle your fancies, tickle whatever you got going on. But here's a church community that says we're desperate for Jesus and we're going to pursue being conformed to his image with reckless abandon. We may hurt each other along the way, but that's okay. God's given us tools for healing in those moments. There's actually a book I got years ago. It's one of my favorite books. You would think, you know, outside the word of God, the Bible, there, there's lots of instruction there. Uh, Howard mentioned it, Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, all that. There's a guy, a pastor who wrote a book. He's, it's called Life in the Body of Christ, Privileges and Responsibilities of the Local Church. And literally, this is how do we live in community with each other. And this is ph phenomenal. This is a phenomenal book. I wish every single person would read this book. Because it puts into perspective things that are more than laser beams, tight jeans, and fog machines. It is Curtis Thomas out of Florida. He's a pastor. And again, I'm not going to necessarily uh, uh, agree with everything, but I tell you what, I love this because it just says, this is how you're in community with each other. Because guess what? If we don't learn how to be in community with each other here, what's it going to be like for eternity? Where the person you like the least is actually probably be your neighbor. This is how God works, right? It's like, you didn't like that guy? Guess who's your next door neighbor? So what is the church? It is not an institution. It is not four walls. It is not a roof. It is not pastors with tattoos. It is, I mean, it could be those things, but it's so much more, right? We need to just, we need to, we need to fall in love with what God has designed for us to be. And, and I believe Luke 17 gets us there. And, it, and it's going to probably springboard into other conversations. Easter's next Sunday. Woohoo! He is risen. 
See, that's what the hundreds of years, saints of, of old used to say that as, as response, right? Call response. He is risen. And then you say, he's risen indeed. So this is practice for next week. So all the guests that come on Easter, you know, the Easter Christians, Christmas Easter, they know, wow, these people are exuberant. They must really, I'm prepping you for that, that time next week. So he is risen. He is risen that's what I'm talking about. People are like, whoa, these people must believe that. Yeah, we do. I was getting advertisements from churches on my Facebook page like crazy. Have you guys got this? Like, here's what, here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to advertise Easter on Facebook. Because here's what I believe. Not that that's wrong, but you are the best advertisement if you want someone here on, in church on Easter. Can I get an amen from somebody? I'm not going to spend money that you have given to the church to use for ministry to produce rave cards and to produce advertisements for social media so that you can invite people you don't even know to church. I'm going to lean on you as the people of God to say, I work with people, I live with people, I live around people, I shop, and I know people. God wants to use you as the advertisement to bring them to church on Easter so that maybe they hear the good news of Jesus Christ. See, that's church. It's not marketing, it's you being salt and light. Luke 17, here we go. I love the church. I have not given up on the church. I, this is why I, I do what I do, because I'm taking people like you and myself, and we all have rough edges, and I'm trying to s just pray before God, creating us the community that we need to be before you, Father. Create in us this unity and this harmony and this love with one another that whether we're on the mountaintops or we're in the valleys, we're going we're gonna to pursue Jesus together. How do we do that? Luke 17 is where we're going to be. We're going to tackle, yes, 19 verses. I know you guys are going, oh, crud. We got, we got baptisms at 1030. Someone at 1020 just say, time. 1020s, time, and then I'll know at that time I've got a couple minutes to, to land the plane, and then we'll get and we'll baptize people. Awesome, awesome thing right out here on the patio. So Luke uh, 17 is where we're going to be, and he says to his disciples, verse 1, it's inevitable, I like that word, that stumbling blocks should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord says, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and, and it would obey you. But which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep would say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately, sit down to eat? Will he not say to that, that servant, prepare something for me to eat, properly clothe yourself, serve me until I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. So it comes about, he's passed on the way to Jerusalem. He's passing between Samaria and Galilee, and he entered a village. And there are 10 leprous men who stood at a distance who met Jesus. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, guess what he said to them? Go and show yourself to the priests. And it came about that when they were going, they were cleansed. And not one of them, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back. So one of the ten turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Where are, were there not ten that I cleanse? Maybe Jesus wasn't good in math like me. But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your, your way. Your faith has made you well. What, what does God want us to say in these? It seems like detached stuff going on here, right? And I'm going to hopefully bring some sort, of, some sort of unity to this to communicate to you that Jesus wants to produce a, a, a Jesus-centered community, which is the church. 
So how do we do that? There's two things. There's spiritual principles and there's spiritual power. First is this, spiritual principles. The spiritual principles are three that we see here in Luke. And, and again, we can add to these, but I think these are so good, so valuable, so rich, so important that uh, we, we need to listen to what Jesus says. And, and again, Jesus is into intentional discipleship. The most important work that we who b- love Jesus, believe in Jesus, have to be involved in is discipleship. How are we maturing and growing in our faith in Christ? And so these are three things that Jesus isolates that I think are going to be three that really speak to our lives today. The first being this, n- principle number one, that we are to create helpful pursuit of holiness. Verses one and two. There are people who will come into our lives that we can call stumbling blocks. You know what happens when you come across a stumbling block? You stumble. Stumble is falling. Stumbling is failing. Stumbling is being discouraged. Stumbling is is going, you're not helping me, but you're hindering me. See, the greatest thing we can do for one another is help one another pursue holiness. Like, do we have people in our lives that are helping us or hindering us in this pursuit of holiness? Because I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes there's no middle ground. It's one or the other. Sometimes we surround ourselves with people who aren't really helping us and they're just hindering us. And they're not making our walk in Christ easier. I'm not saying the walk of Christ is easy, but I'm going to tell you, it helps when you have people in your corner that are going to encourage you toward godliness and not the opposite. Right? There's a reason why Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Some of us have the antithesis of those kind of people in our lives. And so the pursuit of holiness is important because we need men and women asking us, how are you being made holy today in Christ? How are you looking more like Jesus in your life today than you did yesterday? What is God doing? How many of us even have people asking us that question versus, did you watch the game last night? Big deal. Right? Like, maybe this is too radical. Maybe I'm just living in my pie-in-the-sky, Pollyannish type view of the church. But last time I heard is that God is going to perfect his work in us to make us more like Christ, Philippians chapter 1. And if we're not surrounding us with those kind of voices that are cheering us on versus criticizing us versus condemning us versus leading us down the wrong path, what, what good is it? See, we are called to help and not hinder one another in our pursuit of Jesus and conformity to his image. It's a serious thing to sin against another believer and tempt her or him to sin. It is a serious thing if I end up being the obstacle by which you go away from God versus toward God. I was part of a church where I was asked to leave as the pastor, and it was for unbiblical reasons, and majority of that church stood up and left that church, and to this day, 12 plus years later, those people have never stepped foot in a church again. And I put it on the, I love those men. I pray for those men. I've forgiven the men that, have, that dealt with me in this way. But it is on them as they stand before God. When God says, how come you hindered those believers in their pursuit of holiness? That's between them and God. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to stand in the way. I don't want to be a a Pharisee. This is who Jesus is dealing with, right? The Pharisees were ones that were making their religion so difficult, so hard to follow, that they were deterring people rather than delighting them in Christ. This is why Jesus is saying this. Don't be so religious you're turning people off. Be so religious that you're turning people on. Help People pursue holiness. You're not called to destroy someone's faith. You're called to develop it. God can use each and every one of us in each other's lives. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to have a minister. minister. You can just be simply one who's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Ephesians chapter 5. This has to do with three things I'm thinking about under this topic. Write these down on the side. What we say. James chapter 3. 
says, don't you dare try to communicate the word of God. It is a, is a serious thing, right? Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you do not know what, that we who teach will be judged with stricter, uh, greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. Notice the word stumble. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. He is able to bridle his whole, whole body. This is, this is pastors. This is preachers. This is reverends. This is ministers. This is anyone who would take the word of God and communicate it in a way where you better know what you're saying because you don't want to lead people into falsehood. You want to lead them in truth. And I think a lot of people out there have let use the Bible as an instrument of error and falsehood. A blunt instrument in a, in a bad way. Right? There have been so many people hurt by the word of God simply because people have said wrong things. You know what I don't do is I don't stand up here and I joke about this on Saturday night because I call it my school night when I'm out, maybe Lori and I are out with somebody and it's like, hey, I gotta get home and figure out what I'm speaking on tomorrow morning. I don't do that. You know what? I pour 20 hours plus a week over what I'm saying because I'm, I'm, I'm laying out before the Lord my heart saying, what will you have the church know today? It is a serious thing to communicate the, the truth of God. I wanna make sure I do it in a faithful way to what he wants. It's in how we uh, live our lives, you guys. Don't you dare masquerade your, yourself out there as a, as a believer when you're really not, right? You, we can all act like a Christian hour and a half on Sunday mornings, amen? You live like heaven here, you live like hell there. That's not the way. First uh, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, here's what Paul says. I'm going to charge everyone, right, but take care that this, this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak, meaning we have a lot of rights, we have a lot of liberties. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable, Meaning you could live your life in a particular way, but the first question you should ask is this. Is this consistent with God's glory in the work of Jesus Christ and what he's doing in my life? If there's inconsistency in how you're living your life out there, you need to reevaluate where you're at with God. Right? You see me walk into a strip club, which I never would because I'm married to the hottest woman in the world. But if I ever walked into a strip club, you have every right to stand in front of me and say, what are you doing, pastor? I knew a guy who literally followed, this, this is before the days of the internet, you know, the internet now makes everything private, and we can all kind of hide in our, our holy little, uh, you know, our little closets of, of impurity and stuff like that. I knew a pastor I used to work with who followed a guy who had a Christian fish on his license plate into uh, an adult bookstore. He literally followed him into the parking lot, and the guy gets out, and the guy goes, hey, uh, good afternoon, is this your car? The guy goes, yeah, he goes, then either you remove that Christian fish from your car or you get back in and leave here. That's, that's called ballsy pastor. <laughs> don't, don't we need more ballsy pastors? Like, I'm not gonna follow you around during the week, but here's what I'm praying, that your life is being lived consistent with your testimony in Jesus Christ. Here's what I'm hoping, that you're living in a way that, is, is, is in a worthy manner of your calling in Christ, Ephesians chapter, uh, Colossians chapter three, Ephesians chapter three, one of those. How you live, what you teach, how you think, Romans chapter 14. Paul says this, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I mean, you may come to certain conclusions that you know what, we may disagree on, and that's okay. I'm not gonna allow that to be something the way I think or my philosophy concerning something standing in the way of our fellowship with one another. We tend to make the minors the majors and the majors the minors. And we hurt one another in the process. There's a reason why Jesus says, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for each other. One of the greatest evangelistic tools to reach a dying world without Christ is how we relate with one another. If we can't get our crap together, what good is it? And you want to know how serious this is? Why this is serious is that Jesus uses mafia-style language in Luke 17. I mean, I love Goodfellas. I love Casino. I love Sopranos. I love a good mafia. Here's Jesus going full Tony Soprano. If you act like this and end up hindering versus helping somebody, may a stone be tied around your neck, thrown into the, the Colorado River, and you sink and you sleep with the fishes. Can I ask you, do you think Jesus is treating this topic lightly? 
He's not saying, go down to the convent, let a nun get a, a ruler, let her just slap you on the wrist, just dis- you know, just go away, don't do it again. No, Jesus says, you are better off dying a hitman-style death than hindering someone from w- pursuing Jesus in their life. I don't think many of us have given this much thought. I think we see the millstone thing and we think, yeah, we, we're to treat this lightly. Nothing so enrages Jesus than someone trying to lead one of his disciples away from him. I've dealt with men and women who have come into the church and they are sheep, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And I'm not a nice guy when it comes to people trying to sow false beliefs, false doctrine, false theology, because I love you. And as a shepherd loves a sheep, I'm going to lay my life down for you. Don't, don't make me angry when it comes to the things of Jesus. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> Better for the pastor to die than teach errant doctrine. Better to die than to have a lifestyle that trips others up. Better to die than to have attitudes that drive others away from Christ. First two sins in the Bible, Genesis. Eve tempts Adam. Yes, Adam shirked his leadership, but Eve led him astray. Abel dies at the hands of his brother, When confronted, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? Think about this. First two sins in the Bible. The one person leads another, as it were, into sin, and the second person involves the other person by refusing any responsibility for their well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, should those two things not be present in this church community? We vow to one another we will not lead one another into sin, and secondly, I will take great responsibility because you're my brother, you're my sister. And you have my word on it. Watch yourselves. Watch what you teach. Watch how you live. Watch how you behave. Can I tell you how many times over the past year I've had uh, moments where I've dropped my head into my hands moments because I've seen the church community misrepresent Christianity where people, because they post certain thoughts or opinions or they vocalize certain thoughts or opinions about things that ultimately eternally don't matter, where I'm sitting there going, they've just now lost an opportunity to tell that person about Jesus because they were, were pro-Trump or pro-Biden. Or they were anti-mask or for-mask. Or, boy, people, they're, they're willing to die on certain hills. I'm sitting there going, when's the person going to die on the hill of Jesus? I, I, and, I'm, and I'm speaking to several of you who have used your opportunities to share your opinion, and because you haven't been thoughtful, you haven't been gracious, you haven't been kind in your tone, you have lost opportunities to tell anyone about Jesus because you were so pro-Trump. Good job. Like Jesus is going to be like, you articulated Trump's political platform so well, I'm so proud of you, come into heaven. You know what he's going to say to you? Shame on you. Because you took an important topic and you made it penultimate. Where was Jesus in that conversation? I'm speaking to you, church, because the church is notorious for fighting battles that don't matter in time or eternity. The only battle worth fighting is the battle for people to love Christ. That's it. Put that on my gravestone. Love Jesus, period. I don't care how you vote. I don't care what football team you root for. I don't care what, how you feel about the economy. These are in good conversations, but what is ultimate is where do you stand with Christ? That is the most important question any single one of us can answer. Can I get an amen from somebody? Guys, I'm just starting, okay? So buckle in. But we do need to have, secondly, healthy processes of, for, of rebuking. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is a tough word, rebuke. (laughs) Um, I'm going to just tell you right now, it's easier to rebuke than forgive people, amen? And some of you delight yourselves in rebuking. You would actually say you have a spiritual gift of rebuking. I'm going to tell you, if you think you're God's appointed instrument for the, the spiritual gift of rebuking, you've automatically disqualified yourself from rebuking. Rebuking is not easy, but it is commanded. 
What does this word rebuke mean? It means this. When someone sins against us, Jesus commands, and I'm going to use these two words intentionally, he commands a private and loving rebuke. Notice the two words, private and loving. Private, you don't blast it out to everybody for their business because it's not in their business. You keep it to the parties involved, and if it's just one person, then you just keep it to that one person. And it's loving. Rebuking is gracious. Rebuking is gentle. Rebuking is loving. We are called to gently disclose the wrong that's been done and not to tell everybody else about it, but to keep it among those because you value the relationship. And if, as if the enemy needs another thing to work, uh, to work division inside the church. I remember in college ministry, we had this really cool college ministry. It involved uh, couches and chainsaws and fog machines. It was all that cool stuff. So uh, ask me about the chainsaw thing later, all right? So, so we're doing college ministry, tons of college students and uh, I was just flippantly talking about a movie, and I love, like, really kind of dark comedies, and there was a comedy out, and it really made fun of, like, eating disorders, and I totally didn't, totally didn't even think about it. I recommended it to all these college students, and a group of girls came up to me and said, we deal with eating disorders, and they said, by you recommending that movie, it, it hurt us, and you know what I did? I cried. I apologized, I repented, I sought forgiveness. Why? Because I treated something trivially that meant something so difficult for these girls. And you know what they did? They rebuked the pastor. But they did it in a way where it was restorative. It was healing. And you know what it caused me to do? It caused me to now go, okay, before I mention something like that, I need to consider my audience. I need to consider what other people are. Did I have the right? Did, was, I, was I totally lawful in doing it? Sure, but was it profitable? No, because it hurt some people. And you know what? I have a feeling that my days of being rebuked are not over. And that's okay. Because we need one another, and if there's some area of my life that needs to be addressed, I trust you guys. Just because I have a pastor in front of my name doesn't make me any different than you. We all stand on level ground before the cross of Christ. Amen? We're all in this journey together. And so, our aim is not to embarrass or hurt the offender, but to encourage him or her to repent. That's the goal. Because repentance greases the way for forgiveness. And I I do believe that rebuking is the prelude here. But we don't come to the person and point out every sin. I don't want you coming with a laundry list of things. Let's just take care of these things as things arise. Right? Don't wait until the end of the year and be like, so it's the year of atonement, Scott, and I've got this list of eight grievances. It's not Festivus, okay? So let's just skip that. We do lovingly bring sin to a person's attention with the purpose of restoring that person to God and other people. That's the goal, restoration. You need some verses? I thought so. Matthew chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault one-on-one because it's between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Yes, restoration. But if he does not, take one or two others along with you. Again, this is not Vito and Tony, uh, the mafia guys, right? Like, hey, we're going to make you an offer you can't refuse. That's not the mentality here, right? We bring someone else because we believe community is important and restoration is important. So we take others because the establishment of of, of evidence of two or three witnesses, everyone's there to help in the healing process. If you refuse to listen to them, tell it to the church. If you refuse to even listen to the church, let them be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. This means that the gospel is so present in our relationships with one another that if a person refuses gospel reconciliation, they are a foreigner to the gospel. Think about it. And I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven, right? For, and this is great. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Specifically, this is in the context of restoring fractured relationships. God is in the presence of restoring relationships in the church. Is that awesome? How about Galatians chapter 6, verse 1? Check this out. 
Brothers, if anyone's caught in a a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him with a spirit of gentleness. I don't know how clear it gets. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. How about Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32? Be kind. Thank you, my brother. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. I remember during COVID, there was something I did. I made a poor choice during COVID. Uh, who hasn't made a poor choice during COVID, right? <laughs> I made a poor choice. Uh, and I made, I made a, a family really upset. I made a family really upset. And uh, they, they, yeah, they, they opened up a can of whoop ass on me. And then I talked to the husband who just said, we need to talk. And I said, awesome. There's rebuke. There's repentance. There's forgiveness. And after an hour-long conversation on the phone, I'll tell you what, we both came out stronger people in Christ and with one another. Ladies and gentlemen, these awkward moments, these these difficult moments, the moments that you don't want to live in are the moments God is using to say, I'm making you as a church community stronger. And we can talk through it through tears and through laughter and through pain Okay, five things real quick. Number one, pray. Before you go to your brother to rebuke them, pray. Sounds like a good place to start, doesn't it? Second, approach them as a friend. You're for them, not against them. Right? You want someone that's in your corner. They know that you want what's best for the relationship. That's the mentality. Third, you, you imagine that it is the, that the person that committed the offense wasn't intending the worst. Right? They did something. Don't automatically go, they meant the worst. Maybe they didn't. Assume the best. Assume that was just a, a, a dumb oversight. Fourth, clearly state the problem. Don't belabor it. Don't beat it. Write it out. Script it out. Make it simple. And then number five, it's just express thankfulness for the opportunity to talk. Express thankfulness for the opportunity to be truthful. Express gratitude for the fact that you know what, you're in community with one another and God's working, just be, be, be thankful. Because n- number f- uh, three is the healing practice of forgiveness. And notice what Jesus says. If your brother, how many of you have had someone in your life that's committed a sin against you seven times a day? That's a lot, isn't it? It almost as if, like Jesus says, if you're not in the habitual practice of forgiving, you're not in authentic relationships with people. Think about that. Perhaps the depth of your relationships is seen in how many times you forgive people per day. So you're like, I forgave someone three months ago. You're not living in authentic relationships. Even in marriage. I know, sensitive topic. Even in marriage. Man, you fight and squabble. I think I've asked for my wife's forgiveness three times this past week. Thankfully, it wasn't in one day. Maybe it was. I don't know. I forgot. We moved on. But forgiving is healing. Aren't we often too spineless to rebuke and too resentful to forgive? Jesus requires us the courage to rebuke and the compassion to forgive. That's so important. Courage to rebuke, compassion to forgive. And here's what makes forgiveness easier. I'm not saying it's easy remembering what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Forgive others as God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Okay, three things. No wonder the disciples cry out, increase our faith. Because looking at these things, you're going, I can't do this. You can do this. God never commands you to do something he's not ready to empower you to do. What's the the spiritual power at work, which is our second point? Faith. So let's talk about this. Spiritual power for a Jesus-centered community. Lord, increase our faith. What are the elements? When we speak of faith, what do we mean? I'm going to define it by two things that I think are going to revamp this whole idea of faith in your mind and in your hearts. Faith is this. Number one, it is an eagerness to know the size of God. Too many times we make faith the emphasis. This is not about the quantity of your faith, the size of your faith. 
God's the one who moves mountains. God's the one who moves mulberry trees. Nowhere in scripture does it say you move mountains. See, it is the object of your faith which is incredibly important. We make faith the object and we forget God. We never want to live our lives where we make faith the big thing and God unnecessary. Let me, let, hear me clearly, please. It is not so much great faith in God that, that is required as faith in a great God. How great is your God? This is why Jesus says that if you say, if you have faith like a mustard seed, like God can work with the smallest bits of faith because he's a big God. It's not so much great faith in God that is required as faith in a great God. We can so analyze and scrutinize our faith so much that we neglect the object of our faith. We become idolaters. We make faith the God, and faith is not the God. The God is God. And he can do anything he wants to do, right? The kingdom of God is advancing, and we need to trust his power to do so. So faith, by definition, clings to God, casts itself upon God's power, rests in God's strength, relies on God's adequacy. If you're not pursuing the size of your God, you're going to have small faith. How big is your God? This is why the saints of old testify, think about God. Look to God. Consider what God has done. This is why in the Old Testament they set up stones of remembrance because they wanted generation after generation to know God did something miraculous here. God created the world ex nihilo. He parted the Red Sea. He, he rescued Daniel from the, the mouth of the lions. He raised Jesus from the dead. If you do not believe in the bigness of your God, your faith will be small. And it's not just the, 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 the eagerness to know the size of God, which is a pursuit in and of itself to understand God, to know God. It is secondly this, and this is huge, the willingness to obey the will of God. God will not grow your faith if you don't do what God wants you to do. Right? This is where we have to understand that Jesus is not using, you know, he is using hyperbole to make a substantive point. He's saying, which is harder, commanding a mulberry tree to be cast into the ocean or forgive your brothers and sisters who have sinned against us? Too many of us are trying to cast sycamore trees into the Colorado River. And he's saying, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to forgive the person that you know you need to forgive. Faith is stifled in an unforgiving heart. Faith does not grow in bitter soil of our spirits. Faith doesn't grow in those areas that we know we have ruined relationships and God says, go restore them. Go seek healing. Augustine, 1700 years ago. Yes, we can learn from dead people. Augustine said this, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. Meaning, my heart, Lord, sometimes doesn't really believe your promises. Help me to believe your promises because when I believe your promises, your power shows up. Do what God wants you to do and trust that he'll give you the power to do what he's commanded you to do. Will you obey? And what are the evidences of faith? We're sitting right here, and we're going to close this up because I know it's time. Evidence of faith in two stories that Jesus tells. Humility, thankfulness. What servant demands a thanks from his master? Right? Jesus says, when the master says to do things, you do it. And you don't sit and wait for a thanks. If you're waiting for the medal or the parade that God's going to show you because you forgave your friend, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because in the end, we're all unworthy servants. Because you are forever a debtor to God. You never make God a debtor to you. Humility is realizing that we are forever indebted to this great God of ours. It's like the military. I've never seen a soldier say, uh, Commander, uh, where's my thanks? You are now enlisted into God's service. And just the fact that he even knows your name and he's called you to, to, to be on his side, you are an unworthy servant, meaning you are forever indebted to him. That's humbling. But then the lepers, 10 of them come out, they're all healed. One of them comes back and he's a Samaritan, he's a foreigner. 
how we have lost the, the practice of gratitude. The one foreigner fell down at his feet and glorified God. You have healed me, you have rescued me, you have saved me. See, true faith not only evidences itself in humility, it evidences itself in thankfulness. And you know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for a God who has cleansed me. I'm thankful for a God who has delivered me. I'm thankful that God has given us community together. Thankfulness will kill any sort of dissatisfaction that resides in your hearts. You lacking contentment? You lacking satisfaction? You got the Mick Jagger syndrome? Guess what? Become thankful. Keep it all in perspective, you guys. I know I rushed through. This is the fastest last points I think I've ever preached in my life. But I think you guys get the, the, the gist of it. Next week, Easter, we get to talk about the kingdom of God. Read ahead if you want. It lines up perfect with Easter. We got baptisms happening. We get to celebrate how God's working in our church community. Love you guys. Thankful for you guys. Let's pursue Jesus together. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, today for a beautiful morning. Chance to, to adore you, to worship you, to be thankful before you. Thank you that... You would have been right and just to leave us without cleansing, but because of Jesus, you have cleansed us, you have renewed us, you have, you have made us into new creatures. Thank you, God, for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of community. Lord, continue to shape us into the image of Christ as individuals and as a body. Lord, help us to love one another. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to rebuke one another. Help us to pursue Jesus together for your glory and our good. You are such an awesome God. Thank you for this time together. Be glorified in all things, please, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Let's move.